Homage to the blessed noble and perfectly enlightened one. Namo sadanto suchedoye olahudi sanyao santoshe. Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently, may we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Then Master, Dhamma friends, welcome to our Sudha lecture today. My name is Hung Shur. glad you're with us. Today is Sunday, June 27th here in the Gold Coast of Queensland. It is Saturday night, June 26th in Northern California, where many of you are listening. And uh, no matter where you are around the planet, if you're in China, if you're in Vietnam, uh, if you're hearing, if you're listening in a different language, welcome to our Sutra lecture. I'm delighted to have volunteers who are willing to take this, the words that I say, translate them into Vietnamese and also into Mandarin. That saves us lots of time and uh, also spreads our Sutra lecture around the planet. So. What are we doing today? We are explaining, we're exploring, we're looking into the Flower Garland Sutra, the Avatamsaka, particularly a chapter in the Avatamsaka Sutra that talks about the Bodhisattva, uh, the awakened being, and gives us uh, sp specific instructions of how Bodhisattvas think, how they react, uh, what goes on in their, uh, their minds when they encounter uh, us living beings, when they encounter us uh, messing up and uh, they have to find a new way to teach us, to take us across. Uh, and then it also teaches us kind of, the idea is it's, it's opening a road for those of us who aspire to imitate bodhisattvas who wanna walk on that path, right, ourselves. So that's, the, uh, that's what we're about. And if that sounds good to you, let's, let's join. going to start first of all we're going to when we're done with the invocation we come back to page 90 that's what we're going to be on before then we're going to zoom ahead to the opening of this chapter of the sutra and we're going to chant it down there we go make it nice and big so you can read it okay uh in English, it's homage to the Buddha's Flower Garland Sutra of great expansive teachings and the ocean-wide Flower Garland Assembly of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. We're going to chant it in Chinese, uh, which is right there on the page. You have your choice. You can do it in, uh, if you follow along with the, the Han Si, if you can read the, the kanji, as they say in Japan. That's, you're ahead of the game. Uh, 
if you're like me, still learning, then you can follow the, the anglicized, the romanized pronunciations in ABCs down below. We even have tone marks for you. So one of the nice things about chanting is you don't have to worry about tones. So. Let's do it with a melody. Here we go. Ready? Namo to us from an instrument that was made over a hundred years ago. This is a century old A.A. Farland banjo made in Chicago, Illinois, 1915. We'll hear more from this old gentleman later on. Back to page 90. Here we go. Okay. There we are. Now, um, just a word here. That's it right there. We're going to start with the the verse that goes Yu Jie Si Jie Wu Si Jie. This one right here. Okay, a little bigger for everybody. There we are. Yeah. Now. Um, I want to say that as the, the person who's got the, the job of opening up the text, of sharing the text, what a nice job, right? Nice work if you can get it. I have to <coughs> keep a balance of, uh, here's, here's what I'm trying to keep in balance, kind of like juggling. People come to the sutra so that they can hear the Buddha's voice. The Buddha's voice is carrying ancient wisdom, timeless wisdom, not just ancient. You have to look back to find it. It's present. This wisdom hasn't gone anywhere. Uh, it's that we stop looking for it. That's where, it, and that's when it goes away, right? but it's always been here and that's what we come for. We wanna be able to uh, dip our hands in it and scoop up the Buddha's wisdom, and, you know, drink as much as drink our fill. And that's the job of the Dharma master uh, in the, the piece of the sutra that just preceded this, it was the Da Fashu, the excellent Dharma master who was the one responsible for uh, sharing, opening it up. So that's, that's what we're after. Um, we had an inspiring uh, meeting earlier today. It was a Saturday afternoon in California, an early Sunday morning here in Australia. 
And we were hearing from young people who followed Master Hua in the 80s and 90s and joined what was called DRBY, Dharma Realm Buddhist Youth. And it was a remarkable time. And that was the fun part about today was getting to see the photos of all of these young people who were high school and college students then. And it was fun to see the youngest one back then is now a Dharma master, is now a bhikshu. Um, they were drawn to Buddhism uh, because they wanted to hear truth. So because our teacher was one of the uh, hallmarks of, of Master Hua Shen, uh, Joshua Shang Shen Xia Hua Bao He Sheng, right? Shi Fu Shang Ren, Master Shen Hua. One of the hallmarks of his teaching was that if you spent one day anywhere close to him, you would, part of that day, you'd be able to hear the Buddha's voice in a Mahayana Sutra. Shi Fu explained sutras, Jiang Jing Shuo Fa. That was one of the hallmarks of, of DRBA monasteries. And those were lively sessions. The Dharma came alive. The sutras were alive. And so these young people, all this, there was a, a large number of young folks within a certain age range, high school and college age, who all showed up at the same time and found each other, found friendship and uh, found a, a uh, sangha. If you use the, they were laymen and laywomen, part of the sangha. Um, they found community and came together and continued, you know, drinking the Dharma with both hands, but doing it in a way that made sense to them. So I talked about juggling and balancing. My job as, as the, the speaker today, of the uh, interlocutor with the Buddha, um, the one who asked the questions and the translator and all of these, the interpreter in the uh, theological circles, they call it the exegete, the one who does exegesis, right? In uh, Hebrew terms, is midrash. You're commenting on on the sacred text. So that's my job. The balancing part is keeping it lively, so that people don't go to sleep after getting their fill of the sutra. And that's a phenomena, which is what the principles of the sutra are mm, deep profound, true. And it's funny how we living beings have a capacity, we have a, we can hold a certain amount of truth and then we're full. And it's like, mm. and it's not unpleasant to fall asleep in a sutra lecture. It's, and, I mean, as long as you don't snore, right? I, I was good at that. I fell asleep a lot during sutra lectures. Uh, not recommended, but I did it a lot. And, the point is that it's much better to stay awake and to make the Dharma connect with our everyday lives. So the balancing, the juggling that I do is I wanna open the mountain of Dharma, the, the mountain of jewels, the Bao Shan, let people come home with their hands full and their backpacks full, their minds and hearts full of dharma, while keeping it current and fresh so that we can draw the connections, right? That's the skill of the dharma master, uh, that archetype individual, to, who can connect the principles with our own experience. That's what matters, that's what counts. So I'm constantly thinking of ways to keep it fresh. And I don't want people at the end of the lecture to say, I 
I don't remember what we read today. What was the sutra? I want people to go, wow, that sutra made sense today. I could feel it. We want to go into the text, not give you some text and then entertain you. That's not the point. That's a ripping people off, right? So it's that balance to make sure that everybody can devour, can feast on as much dharma banquet as they can hold, but at the same time, recognize the wisdom here, that this, these are, you could say, life-saving principles for our dharma body and our wisdom life um, that we can't do without, right? So how, how neat is that for a sutra lecture? What did you do on uh, Saturday night? Well, we listened to a 2,500 year old book. Sounds boring. What was it like? It was fascinating, right? Couldn't do, I, I'll be there next week in line for them to open the door. You know, I wanna be there first to get, my, get closer to the sutra. Oh, no problem. The sutra's in your heart. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so that's what we're about. And that's, that's the job. So with that in mind, you ready? Wanna try it? Um, here's our text. Now we've got a little protocol going on, which is we're in the verse part of the 10th stage of the 10 stages. So the 10 stages chapter, stage number 10 verses portion. And verses are to be chanted. They're sung, they have a melody. So I wanted to uh, let everybody hear the melody before we, here we go. Here we go. That's the melody, uh, random, up the scale, down the scale. It's just arpeggiating, right? It's just a chord. Da, da, dee, 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 dee. It's a pentatonic. Simple, right? The good part about that is you can sing it immediately. Everybody gets it right away, right? So here we go. Here is our first quatrain, our first set of four lines. Ready? Yujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujesujes
Our Bodhisattva is a graduate now. He's in the process of, this is kind of his qualifying exams, but he's already passed. And the sutra is telling us what he knows now. All the things the Bodhisattva can know, because why? This is called the stage of the cloud of Dharma, the stage of the Dharma cloud, the Fayundi, Fayundi. And think about a cloud. The cloud is vapor, shapeless, amorphous, containing these little droplets in motion, arising from an ocean or from steam and about to coagulate and become down as rain or freeze as ice, right? Or boil away as mist again. So this is the cloud of Dharma, Fayun. And the Dharma here, the, that is the cloud, is the Buddha's teachings. So the Bodhisattva here has so much knowledge of what the Buddha taught that it's like a cloud. He's, it's just this thunderhead without the danger, without the scariness of thunder. It's a great cumulus, cumulonimbus, giant cloud of knowledge of Dharma. Last ground, last stage, he was a excellent Dharma master, Dafasher, grand Dharma master, which meant that he was able to respond to your problem. He could tell you, got a problem? I got the answer, right? And did, right? Got a doubt? I can take it right back to clarity, right? Got confusion? I can straighten it because his wisdom was abundant, a lot, a lot of wisdom. And there were little proof stories. That's one of the best parts of the Avatamsaka is when they give you uh, a description of the Bodhisattva, there will be a kind of a play, a little playlet, a little uh, skit that often goes to extremes. It's often outrageously pushing the boundaries to show you the limitlessness of your potential for wisdom and what it can do. It's not only wisdom, it's its function. What wisdom does when it goes to work. That's the, the Ti and the Xiang and the Yong, right? It's what it's made of, what it looks like, and then what it does. This is the what it does part of the Bodhisattva's wisdom. Here in the 10th stage, more. It's even, even more, more than the ninth stage. The Bodhisattva now has wisdom that essentially goes on and on. It's limitless and boundless. Um, actually, to try to bring this alive, to talk about what the Bodhisattva has, what he knows now, is we, we can look at space itself. And uh, I wanted to recommend, I've got a recommendation for everybody. Uh, NASA, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, the US uh, Space Agency. NASA has a website of picture of the day. So if you type in NASA, N-A-S-A, picture of the day, it'll take you right to it. And somebody, Somebody on the payroll in NASA has a really good eye and has access to lots of image databases. And they pick out every day some extraordinary image, most the, not just of the planets or space or galaxies, but often, right? They also will occasionally pick something like a butterfly's wing or uh, ice crystals or something to, to bring it back to earth. But the ones that are most extraordinary for NASA are the, the pictures of taken from the Hubble telescope uh, and other, you know, extraplanetary images that are just, you look at them and your mind goes like that. So NASA picture of the day, check it out. Uh, they're free, free and you can use them for uh, desktops on your computer, et cetera. So 
that's a useful uh, referent for what's going on here with the Bodhisattva's wisdom. Bodhisattva's wisdom is now limitless. No stopping. It doesn't stop. It just goes on and on and on. And when I thought of what would that be? Well, it could be um, you don't want to even say the light of the sun because the sun is a star. It will go out. Think about the space surrounding the sun. As far as I understand, I mean, there are mathematical calculations of this, but space just goes on, right? It goes on and on and on. And our little tiny planet circulating, <clears throat> our one sun in our one galaxy in a corner of, of, our, of the universe is just, right? It goes on and it goes on. So the bodhisattva's wisdom is like that now. And it begins with his mind, your mind, my mind. It begins inside, right? And we've got a share, we have a piece of it. So it would be a mistake to give it to the bodhisattva and say, wow, how wonderful he is, she is. No, nah, it's, we share it. What does he know? That's our topic today. Celebrating the success of the bodhisattva on the 10th stage. He has now ascended to the stage of the Dharma cloud. He has received the anointing of the crown of his head, the consecration. He has ascended to the rank of Dharma prince, Buddha to be. And from the next 12 verses that I've counted, we're talking about what he knows, what the sutra is going to tell us about the contents of the bodhisattva's knowledge on the stage of the Dharma cloud. Okay, we good? That's the, need a little bit of a palate cleanser here. Back to reality. What does the Bodhisattva know now? He knows the desire realm, the form realm, and the formless realm, and the Dharma realm, and the worldly realm, and the realm of beings. All those jie, all those sta stations, all those places. What's the desire realm? Hells, ghosts, Animals, humans, asuras, devas. Six levels called the sixfold path, the six spoked wheel, turning like a wheel. That's our realm. I was, I made a promise before I came, I was coming down my driveway today and the kookaburras showed up and had these, this look, you know, hungry, that look they get hungry. And this, it's a scam. They're, they're just, it's like puppy eyes, right? Feed me, feed me. I'm starving. So no, they're not. They're chubby, chubby kookaburras, but they were like, feed me. And I said, after lecture, I'll be back. Have to be patient. Do you understand? They're like, hmm. This is my interaction just 30 minutes ago with these big beaked kookaburras. And they know I'm a softy and they found my, my lever, found my spot. So we interact with the animal realm. Um, we also interact without knowing it with the ghost realm and the deva realm, the spirit realm, because <clears throat> our eyes don't pick up that level of the electromagnetic spectrum. We don't see them. They're there. We don't see them. We don't see the hells um, ordinarily, right? They're there. And our vision 
uh, limits our ability to know those realms. The Bodhisattva on the stage of the Dharma cloud knows the desire realm. He knows the next realm up and the next realm above that. What are, what's that? That's the form realm, which is also known as the Brahma realm. That's a realm where gods live, devas, plural, more than one. And it's a realm that you enter through samadhi, through stillness, through zheng, ding, zheng, shou, right focus and right wavelength, <laughs> right? Zheng shou, you, you get the right channel. You tune into the right channel. And think of a radio dial, the old fashioned radio dial, right? Now, what do we have? Now we have URLs. What if you're looking for a replacement for your iPad and you type in appla.com.au or appla.x.com? You don't get to the Apple store, right? Because you should be appla. That's bujeng show with wrong wavelength, right? In the past, we had a dial with numbers of the AM radio or FM radio bandwidth or shortwave. You get the right tune it to, ah, and then the voice comes in, you can hear it. Ah, here's the news, here's the music, here's the weather. That's the junk show, right? This is, I'm talking metaphorically about the mind. Bodhisattva can, you can meditate and get to Chung Ding Chung Shu and reach the form realm. It's a realm of devas. There are 28 different levels of it. And that's where gods live. And also arhats live there, waiting to become four stage arhats. The formless realm is four more levels of meditative trance of samadhi meditative focus that is another level of gods they're devas and master hua would explain these to us and always say yeah these really they don't even have bodies their consciousness is so refined by the practice that they do he says it's totally blissful don't go there <laughs> kind of like saying yeah wow florida Ah, oh, so nice in the winter. Don't go there. <laughs> too many insects, too many pythons, right? Yeah, yeah. So the pythons escaped. Eastern Burmese pythons, the big yellow pythons. People would get them as pets. And then when they got too big, they would just chuck them into the Everglades or into the swamps. And the pythons were like, oh, this is nice. And they got very, very big. There is now an epidemic of very large Tatmangsha. They're beautiful snakes, but they're 10 feet long and have no enemies. Nothing can kill them. Nothing can control them. And they are out of control. So yeah, uh, Florida. Not to say, not if you live in Florida, no offense. Uh, not don't want to get a letter from the Florida tourist board saying, I thought you were a compassionate monk. Why are you telling people? You know, never. No, I don't want so. Mm. Sherfa would say, don't go to the formless realm. Nice place. Don't go there. Why? Too nice. You can't progress. You're still in mortality. Your, your lifespan does come to an end after thousands of years. And then you have to start over. So he would say, know it, recognize it, keep your passport in your hand, travel through, don't stop. Keep moving towards Buddhahood, towards Nirvana, towards Bodhi, right? The realm of Dharma, the Dharma realm, the worldly realm, right? What is the realm of Dharma? It's a place where principles thrive, where you act according to precedence of wisdom that you discover in your own nature. Name one. What, what would a Dharma realm principle be? Well, 
we all inhabit a Dharma realm where the principle of repaying kindness is a big motivator and is a source of joy, right? Generosity, giving to others, often because you realize you've been given to, that's a source of inexhaustible happiness. There's a principle, right? And it's funny, it's the, the next one is the, the worldly realm, right? The Bodhisattva knows the Dharma realm where we all live, but he, she also can live in, knows, doesn't leave the worldly realm or what the opposite is true. People, most of us are happy only when we get stuff. And after we get stuff, it doesn't hit the spot. And so we want to get more stuff. And so greed arises. And we have these incredible imbalances of wealth. Even essentials get poorly distributed because we seek, seek, seek more, 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 more. And it doesn't hit the spot, right? That's the worldly realm, right? The Bodhisattva goes, yeah, okay, flip it over. Go to the Dharma realm where... The thing that makes you happy is giving, is sharing, generosity. They say helping others is the source of true happiness. Right? So the Bodhisattva knows these places, can travel through them, use them to teach. And the realm of beings, oh my goodness, um, are one of our most uh, instructive Mahayana text, the Sharangama Sutra, uh, takes us through all 25 realms of living beings. And uh, what is it about living beings? Um, we, our knowledge is limited by our eight, what are called the 18 realms, our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. And the six consciousnesses that pick up what your eyes see, what your ears hear, knows, smells, tongue, tastes, body feels, mind cognizes, right? And then pushes that over using sight, sound, smells, taste, sensation, to touch, and garments, right? Six senses, six sense objects, six consciousnesses, how clean are they? How, how sharp are they? Um, I found my hearing decaying. And for somebody who enjoys music as much as I do, wow. For somebody who lives through language, I'm, I'm a language nerd, right? And to have my hearing start to go, whoa. So yeah, the um, we living beings are bound by our senses. And we uh, often lack wisdom because things get in the way of our sense perceptions. Things like greed, things like anger, when greed isn't satisfied. Things like delusion, when we hear misinformation and take it to be true, right? So that's the realm of living beings. The Bodhisattva goes, yep, 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 I remember, I remember. I know what it's like. I know what that's like. I came from there, right? Bodhisattva is clear on all this. What has number? What is numberless? Things that can be counted and things that are knowable but not countable because they don't have unitary form. It's not one, two, three things. It's got no boundary, but it's still knowable. For example, what? Fear. How about that? Fear has no number, but say it's not there, well, it's there. Right? Infinite space that surrounds all these things, all such realms as these, the Bodhisattva thoroughly fathoms and comprehends. Cool. Okay, that's all information, 
right? My mom, uh, bless her heart, had a favorite hymn. Me. Uh, one of the best parts about being a Methodist was when it was time to sing Methodist hymns. Mm. The Methodist hymnal is this fat tome that has these great songs. So good. And her favorite was called His Eye is on the Sparrow. And I know he watches me. Right? Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven and home? So um, I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow and I know he watches me. The idea that God is watching and even sparrows, little birds, still show up on God's radar. Uh, it's a great song. And my mom was her favorite. So that's the story that she learned as a Christian, that God has a big database. And God's paying attention. You're not alone. Right? He's watching. On one hand, you could say, so you better be good. Like Santa Claus is coming to town. And if you're not good, you're going to get coal in your stocking at Christmas. Well, that's, that's one idea. God's watching and he's going to bust you if he catches you. He watches you doing the stuff that you're doing right now. Not, that's not the, the heart of that hymn. The heart of the hymn was God is with you. You're not alone. Right? You never walk alone. So, Okay, that gives you comfort. That's a good thing. That's positive. It saves you from fear and from loneliness. Where is that God's database kept? <coughs> so, yeah, here's our Bodhisattva whose eye is on. His eye is on the desire realm, the form realm, the formless realm, the dharma realm, the worldly realm, and the realm of beings. And I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. What has number? What is numberless and infinite space? All such realms as these, he thoroughly fathoms and comprehends to adapt the Christian hymn. So, yeah, here's our bodhisattva who knows all these things. How cool that worldly realms are available to this bodhisattva. Now, let's pick out the next one. Ready? We want another palate cleanser. Oh, I can't resist, right? Chia 皆能如是而观察 okay. The use of spiritual abilities, their awe-inspiring power. The use of spiritual abilities, their awe-inspiring power. The Buddha's aid and supports, fine and subtle wisdoms. The Buddha's aid and supports, fine and subtle wisdoms. Secrets. Numbers of kalpas, hair tips, and more. 
secrets, numbers of kalpas, hair tips, and more. He can contemplate all these as they actually are. He can contemplate all these as they actually are. Well done. We're, we're all getting that. What is this quatrain? What does the Bodhisattva know? This is Buddha stuff. The one above was world stuff, right? This is Buddha stuff. The use of psychic powers. The awe-inspiring power of spiritual abilities, right? Shen tong miao yong. Te yi gong nang. The ability to use the divine ear, the divine eye, to know past lives, to know your thoughts, right? To uh, be able to transform your body and also the ability to end all outflows. This bodhisattva can do those things. That's ordinary folks can. You have to cultivate to get there. If you cultivate, you can get there. Even dragons, animals, in the animal realm can, you know, spiritual beings, spiritual animals can attain some of these abilities. Bodhisattva masters them all. The Buddha's aid and supports fine and subtle wisdoms. This kind of refined function of your nature, Bodhisattva's got it all. Secrets, right? What, what are secrets? Shirba Bogongfa the 18 special Buddha dharmas that are unavailable to any but Buddhas, which is another level of samadhi. How many eons that it takes for Buddhas to come and to, to after in, and then enter nirvana? Hair tips, worlds on hair tips, right? And more, the Bodhisattva contemplates these as they actually are. Doesn't see them, contemplates them. Right. He sees them. He doesn't, it's not a knowing, it's not a discriminating, it's a visioning of all of these, like a reflection. So, okay, so worldly things and world transcending stuff, the Bodhisattva has that. Right. Right. Okay, what's next? Right. Hmm. We're balancing Sutra Dharma with interpretation. Okay, so stick with me. Here we go. Shou sheng she su cheng zheng dao. Shou sheng she su cheng zheng dao. Miao, sorry, my mistake. Zhuan miao fa lun ru nia pan. Zhuan miao fa lun ru nia pan. Niger, Chimie, Chetofa, Niger, Chimie, Chetofa, Chi so we sho che nung liao, Chi so we sho che nung liao. Okay? Being born, leaving home, cultivating the right path. Being born, leaving home, cultivating the right path. Turning the wondrous wheel of Dharma. Entering nirvana, turning the wondrous wheel of dharma, entering nirvana, including the method of nirvana's liberation, including the method of nirvana's liberation, even what has not yet been spoken, all this he can understand. Even what has not yet been spoken, all this he can understand. What's this? This is known as the Ba Xiang Cheng Dao, the eight hallmarks of every Buddha's accomplishing the way, the Dao. Eight qualities that every Buddha passes through. So hold it. It's like, first of all, every Buddha, right? There's a succession of Buddhas. They come in turn over a specific period of time of discernible time, calculable time. And each of those Buddhas goes through a Joseph Campbell-like hero's journey with Carl Jung-like archetypal hallmarks, archetypical, archetypal hallmarks, 
right? Yeah, this stuff can be known. There are patterns. That's archetypes, stages, patterns. Same, same idea. There are knowable, there are qualities that Buddhists go through on their journey that repeat. Isn't that interesting? Like, huh, this is interesting. Like it's almost kind of like a anthropological. What paradigm, right? So kind of like, yeah, I wanted to like the Trobriand Islanders. I went and studied them for my doctorate and learned about their customs and I wrote my PhD and published it and became known as an anthropologist. Right? Yeah, I mean, why haven't we known about this? Well, which research language did you pick up so that you could look at the primary sources in Buddhist Buddhology? Sanskrit, Pali, Sogdian, <laughs> right? Uh, Uyghur languages, maybe it was Tibetan, maybe it was Nepali, Urdu, right? Chinese, Japanese, Korean. Hmm. So that's the first thing, let's get the tools, then find the texts and go for it. Nobody's holding you back. It's just, yeah, man, oh man. The, uh, this is a huge blending of modern need to know and methodologies with ancient resources. Yeah, I mean, I personally spent six years in the library at UC Berkeley doing this and uh, came upon this thing called the Bashang Chengda. Eight hallmarks, eight characteristics that every Buddha displays on his path to awakening. Okay, right? And furthermore, there's more than one list. They don't entirely agree. We talked about this in detail when we went through the, the prose part. So yeah, Buddhas all do this. Every Buddha goes through this stuff and then they become a Buddha. What, you might be surprised at what are those hallmarks? What are the traits that every Buddha appears with? Well, they are born and all the stories start to ripple out, right? Oh, the Buddha took seven steps and a lotus flower rose to greet his foot and seven, nine, nine dragons sent down ambrosia to bathe him. And he said, Tian Shang, Tian Xia, Wei Wo Du Zun, below the heavens and here on the earth, no one can match my wisdom. I am the honored one. And then he left home jumped over the palace wall, said goodbye to his horse, said goodbye to his wife, not necessarily in that order, and went out into the bush to live. He did walk about for six years, woke up, saw a bright star, awakened to the way, right? So these are these hallmarks, right? Every Buddha goes through the same pattern. Interesting, interesting. Where is this kept? Who keeps, who, who class, who, Calcul uh, catalogs, Who, who's the historian of Buddha's journeys, right? So he doesn't quite, it's not that he wakes up yet. First, he has to subdue the demons, right? The Buddha subdues Mara. So that's an external story. An internal story might be to say that he transforms all the living beings of his own nature. Maybe he has to transform his fear, he has to overcome his fears. Maybe he has to put down a big temper. Maybe he has to buck up his courage, right? Maybe he has to, he's not that, maybe he has to get soft. He has to learn compassion. But the demons that he subdues, there's a list. These, all these stories, right? The ripples go out, you have the eight hallmarks and then, you fill in the flesh and blood around them. Wow. So, for example, uh, maybe what the Buddha has to do is 
he has to um, discover how to respond to uh, instead of he has to subdue his ambition, slow down, and listen to those around him. Right? I had a I'll share a dream. I've told this story before. This was formative in my search. Uh, you know, is it's a moment that I paid attention to, and it was a dream. Dreams often pop up as part of the mind talking to another part of the mind. And before this, uh, before the dream, I had been ambitious on my desire to kaiwu, get enlightened, got to get enlightened, got to get enlightened, right? Got to have Samantabhadra come and rub the crown on my head, say, good indeed, good man, you too have become a Buddha, right? Boy, I was... Uh, the late Houston Smith used to talk about whoring for enlightenment, right? He, I understood what he meant with that. And Master Hua would say, at the point of seeking nothing, there are no further worries. He would say, when you reach that place, when you're seeking nothing else, all your afflictions are over. Because you are still seeking, your afflictions haven't ended. He would say that. <laughs> then, yeah, sure. Well, yeah, sure. Well, meanwhile, when is Samantha Badrik? Yeah. So anyway, um, at a certain point, I had a dream. And in the dream, I was racing up a hill. It's a steep mountain. And I was competing with other seekers of the wave to get to the top of Nirvana Mountain. Had to get there, had to get there. And it was sweaty and hot and exhausting. And I was... <laughs> stitches in my side and, and sore feet and blisters. And I was trying to get there first to get enlightened to the top of Nirvana Mountain. And there was this person in front of me. And he was crippled. He was he had challenged, mobility challenged. That's the, the language. And he was slow. And he had to kind of struggle to get up the mountain. And yet he was also, the rest of us all rushing to get there first, but his rush was very slow and I was behind him and I couldn't go around him. I would try to go left and he would go left and I would try to go right and he would go right. And it was getting pretty frustrating because I wanted to pass him because he was slow, right? And there was a moment when the person in front of me turned around and it was me and I was looking at myself and the face, my face on the person I was looking at was smiling. And he said, you're missing the view, turn around. And I turned around and looked the view from the slopes of Nirvana Mountain halfway up, and there was this infinite Dharma realm, beautiful landscape, breathtaking. You could see everything. And the me who was the mobility challenged, disabled, disability seeker of wisdom said, what's your rush? Only one person can win and get to the top as long as you want to be number one. Everyone else has to find their number, two, 10, 300. Why don't you enjoy right where you are? You don't miss, you're not lacking anything. Wake up. You know? and it was like, oh. So I said, okay, we'll, we'll get to the top in time. I'll help you, I said. So I put my arm around the, the me that was had a disability and 
this, the disability was my ignorance, right? And my attachments and my desires. And so I said, well, let's get up there together bit by bit, we'll make it. Meanwhile, I'm gonna enjoy where I am right now. What's the rush, right? So it's like, yeah, 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 what's the rush? So the, uh, we're still on the eight, eight stages, the eight hallmarks, right? The eight features of the Buddha accomplishing the way. And so the demons that uh, the Buddha transforms may well be that internal ambition that wants to get enlightened, never mind these nasty, slow living beings that are in my way, right? That ain't the way. You have to take the living beings across. That's the way. There is no enlightenment beyond teaching living beings, however messy and long and uncomfortable is the process. Right? So that was my dream anyway. So I understood Bodhisattva transforming the demons might not be Mara outside who's curses, you know, sending his army, sending his daughters. It might be your own desires inside. In fact, guaranteed it's, they're not exclusive. It might be both, but if you don't, if you do one and not the other, you're still not there. So that's number three. So being born, uh, I left out one. The first one is often dwelling in the Tushita heaven, abiding in the Tushita heaven. So the Bodhisattvas in the Tushita heaven waiting to be born, waiting for the time to be right. Then he's born. He comes down to Lady Maya. That's the second one. He's born. He takes those steps, says those words. Then he cultivates the way. Then he subdues the demons. Then he chunda, realizes nirvana, right? Realizes the way, chunda, realizes Buddhahood, not nirvana yet. Then we're still got three more. What's next? He turns the Dharma wheel, Tron Phalan. He enters nirvana. And then Last one is distributes his sharira. All Buddhas do that. Not they're already gone, but his disciples do that. Those are the hallmarks. And if you noticed, if you counted, there's more than eight. They always say bashan, eight hallmarks. Because why? There are different lists. They're not all the same. The lists have different quantities. Okay, so those are the, here they are, being born, leaving home, cultivating the way, turning the wheel of Dharma, entering Nirvana, and then the method of liberation, passing on how to, for us, follow along behind, right? Even things that have not been spoken, the Buddha can understand. All of the Bodhisattva on the 10th stage knows all this stuff. Okay, so we got, that was, uh, three verses from three quatrains, three collections of four lines from the 10th stage. And it all has to do with what the Bodhisattva knows, how much he, she knows now at this stage. And what I wanted to share was what I find amazing here is we're talking about something called epistemology, knowing how we know stuff. How do you know what you know? How does the Bodhisattva know what he knows, she knows? Right? And key to all of this is understanding knowledge. Let's say, Let's say you're a musician and you have a performance coming up with an orchestra and it's, a, it's music that you haven't learned yet. What do you have to do? You have to turn the pages, read the staff 
with all the notes. If it's piano, it's two hands. If it's violin, it's four strings, 88 keys versus four strings. Um, if it's timpani, right, you have to hit, if you're the, the conductor, you have to still master the score. How many times do you have to go over that, those pages and turn the pages before you have absorbed all of it? And then beyond absorbing, absorbing all of it, then you have to master all of it. Uh, pianists don't carry the score onto the stage with them. Have you noticed? Anybody watch a concert pianist? They don't have the music in front of them. It's absorb, right? All the other musicians in the orchestra have a music stand and they can turn the pages, right? Pianist has to memorize it. Um, how do you learn that? Through your eyes and through your ears. So in other words, it's a process of taking something outside and putting it inside. Make sense, right? What about Aristotle? All knowing is remembering. All learning is remembering. That's a mystical idea, isn't it? Which is to say the things that we know we already have, but learning it is somehow uncovering it, remem reminding ourselves that we, something we've known and forgotten or covered over. Hmm. That sounds very much like a Buddhist principle, doesn't it? Here's the key, I think, to describing the bodhisattva's wisdom and how this is different from simple knowledge. All three of our verses today talked about the quantity of things this bodhisattva knows, but the bodhisattva learned them not by study and acquisition, he learned them by starting in a different place, starting with the nature and the mind. That's key. So the ancients said, what is known is that, but how one learns that is through this. Right, you ming ming de. You bring to light your illustrious virtue. Right, da xiao zhi dao zai ming ming de. Right, zai zhi yu zai zhi yu zhi shang. Right, zai qin min zai zhi yu zhi shang. The path to the greatest knowledge is by lighting up this by uncovering your nature, by qin min, drawing near living beings, and then abiding in the highest goodness, which is wisdom and compassion. Now, I'm borrowing Confucius to, des to describe the Buddha's teachings, but I really think this is key. And it's why education has to preserve the study of humanities. STEM courses, right? Science, technology, engineering, mathematics are exclusively learned from outside. We have to learn stress factors. We have to acquire mathematics. We have to, to learn to use sophisticated instruments, machines, right? To, to measure quantities and how much can a single brain hold of those a lot, right? You think about the uh, uh, scientists who are able to put a spacecraft into space up to a space station. That's tremendous quantity of knowledge, right? And then application of that knowledge. The bodhisattva cannot possibly know the Dharma realm, the realm of beings, the realm of desire, the realm of form, the formless realm, the realm of empty space through acquiring knowledge from outside. There's no book from which he or she could learn that. What the Bodhisattva does is they uncover the light of their own nature 
and then all things are knowable, right? It's 180 degrees different. Is that, can you trust that? Science won't agree because why they haven't applied their investigation to the mind of the Bodhisattva. How bizarre, how weird, how strange, because we've all got that very same classroom. We've all got the very same instruments to use, but we don't have the texts or the examples to inspire us to look here first, right? So, yeah, the Bodhisattva Ming Ming De, and the De is the virtue of his or her own nature that they light up, that they fire up, and then from there, everything is known. What does, uh, what did Lao Tzu say? Lao Tzu says, Wei xue ri yi, wei dao er sun, sun zhi you sun, wei yu wu wei, right? Lao Tzu says, if we want to learn, we have to acquire every day. Ri yi, every day we have to get more. Wei xue ri yi. When we're studying, we learn languages, right? You want to learn to speak Spanish or Latin or Japanese, Indonesian, Bahasa, right? We have to go out and acquire. The, you have to conjugate those French verbs. Je suis, tu es, il est, nous sommes, vous êtes, ils sont, right? And it goes on and on like that. And then you can speak a language. If you don't acquire them, you don't have it, right? That's Wei Xu. But Wei Dao, this is Lao Tzu, if you want to cultivate, you reduce, you get rid of the discriminating mind and you get rid of it and you get rid of it till you get back to Wu Wei, which is this place of stillness and no further doing after which everything is available to you, right? So here we have Confucius and Lao Tzu and the Buddha all agreeing that this incredible knowledge that the 10th stage Bodhisattva also reflects is attainable from within, not by acquiring. So all of you students of learning, right? Epistemology, man, this is a radical thesis, isn't it? That we can, the highest knowledge is attainable from within. If we only, if we get rid of the traditional studies of humanity and virtue, humanities, and only acquire things through our senses from outside, we're throwing away the highest knowledge and the path to it. So thank you, Sherfu, for encouraging us to uh, study, to pursue education in the Buddhist tradition, which wants us to study this as well as acquiring knowledge. There's a time when you just acquire as much. I mean, I would love to know Spanish, but I'm old and I, only, I got French and Chinese and a bit of Japanese. If I could go back to that time when language was quick, I would, I would be speaking Spanish. I'd love to be able to communicate to Spanish speakers, communicate the Dharma. I think it's a little late, I don't know. But uh, maybe next time, I'll plant the seeds this time so I can get a couple more Romance languages in there. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Um, wanted to, so thank you, all you pedagogical education educators, right? We must champion the humanities. Otherwise, young people won't even know that the Da Xie Zhi Dao, the path to the Da Xiao Zhi Dao, the path to the highest learning is begins from within. Radical pedagogy, huh? Um, I keep looking to the left here. Why am I looking to the left? Because I've got a, uh, I have a song that I want to, here we go. I, one of the things that I enjoy is um,
I enjoy looking and listening to traditional music. And the United States, America, has been has given a gift of traditional music to the whole world. Country blues. that come from the African-American experience, which was bitter, bitter, enslaved by one group of people, enslaved another group of people. But music was healing. Music was the thing that uh, kept people's hearts from sinking entirely. And uh, those melodies and those, those uh, the, the function of the blues to heal the heart is really powerful. So when we're now looking for settings for Buddhist chanting, um, I go to country blues a lot. So we have a new Guanyin Bodhisattva song here. keep looking at the page you get new words here call her name she'll give you a hand traditional ways in our own culture to bring a message of the Dharma to the, to the West. 
All right, uh, got one more for you. This is uh, one of my favorite, favorite songs. Scott Cook, Canadian, bard, singer, songwriter, traveling man, uh, who was here in Queensland not too long ago. Sam and I listened to Scott and this, this song just says so much. This banjo came from a timber, from the body of a tree, through the workshop of a luthier. Now it's on loan to me. It's good company after dinner. It fits my hands just fine. But someday another singer with a pair of hands like mine will coax out songs much prettier, still hiding in its strings, and sing stronger, braver words than I could ever sing. Folks are going to love it. Of this I'm almost sure. So I'm I'll take good care of it because I'm borrowing it from her. Pass it along, pass it along. May it land in careful hands when we're gone. You carry it for a moment. Time won't loan it to you for long. You don't own it. Just pass it along. Right? The Dharma principles here. This here is my country and doesn't matter which country, you can apply it to your country. This here is my country. Sometimes it's hard to recognize it, but I count myself lucky to have been born inside it. I'm grateful for the rights others struggled hard to win. You can be sure I'm gonna fight when they try to take them back again. Oh, and everywhere are teachers, though some fell along the way, the words they said still reach us, just like you're teaching me here today. You may not speak it loud, but it's clear in what you do. And I hope to make you proud because I borrowed it from you. Pass it along, pass it along. The, the melody goes, pass it along, pass it along. May it land in careful hands when we're gone. Carry it for a moment. I won't loan it to you for long. You don't own it. Pass it along. Seems these days we're in a hurry to grab all up what's left to use, putting patents on discovery making seeds that don't reproduce. If our vision is so narrow, seeing only bought and sold, we will end up like the pharaohs, buried with their gold. We've pushed this thing along. We've all been guided by our fears, but the river sings a song. We've got to be quieter to hear. It's in every child's face. New and hopeful as a stem. Best be gentle with this place, because we're borrowing it from them. Pass it along, pass it along. May it land in careful hands. You carry it for a moment. Time won't loan it to you for long. We don't own it. Pass it along. That's a winner. Thank you, Scott Cook. All right, uh, now's the time when I'm going to ask the monks of Berkeley Monastery, 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 Monastery to let us know if we've got any any news, anything to to, to uh, share with us. Yes, uh, we have the 
Great Compassion Mantra Dedication of Merit tomorrow morning at 6.30 a.m. Hold on here. So 6.30 to 7.30 for all those who have been reciting the Great Compassion Mantra on behalf of the world given the pandemic. Okay, one second here. Uh, for sure, yeah. There you go. And um, if you want to sign up, you can sign up to recite. There's a little form there. Um, so that's tomorrow morning, 6.30. Um, but it will be on YouTube and on Zoom. So you can choose your platform. Otherwise, um, we have our regular BBM online programs. Um, and we have one other special event, which is our Friday morning bowing for India and also the rest of the world. Um, as people know, there's another wave of COVID kind of sweeping through. And um, in some countries who have vaccination, it's, it's maybe less intense, but in many countries, they're suffering greatly. So it's a chance to come together worldwide to, to bow on behalf of the world. So that's on Friday mornings. But other than that, um, our schedule is pretty much the same. Oops. Um, Yep, that's that's pretty much it. I know CDTB right now is still reciting the Avatamsaka Sutra, so that's I right. People are joining that throughout the day, so that's a yeah. really good event. Here we go. Yeah, there's our BBM online schedule. Okay, here we are. There's the Buddha Hall at the Berkeley Monastery. Um, as it is now with COVID, because we haven't reopened. Um, here's all the events, and we want to show you. If you go to drba.org, drba.org, and go right here, Abhatamsika Sutra Recitation, that takes you to this page where you can join in with the Gong Song Hua Yanjing, the reciting the Abhatamsika Sutra. Um, there's a little bit of English, uh, but it's mostly in Chinese, which is suitable because we don't really have a consistent, uh, thorough, complete English translation yet. But even to be able to hear the Avatamsaka Sutra uh, recited and to be able to join, they have page turners, so you can join online, this very special historic event. And there is something, as, as we have just discovered with our three verses today, there's something very wonderful about uh, putting the Avatamsaka Sutra into the air through our eyes, through our mouths, and through our minds. So there's that. So you know how to find that now? Go to drba.org. Look at the, on the front page, there's, here we go, news and events. Scroll down, click here, and that'll take you to, to where you can find it. Okay, great. Thank you for that, Jin Chuan Shi. Let's transfer the merit now with um, Medicine Buddha's mantra, which is right here. And this is our transference verse. Um, the idea is you make a wish. And 100 year old banjo is going to sing along with us that from your heart, you say, I'd like to dedicate the merit from joining in this sutra lecture today or any, any other good deeds that you might have that you'd like to share um, with a wish. And then you make the wish and may all living beings or whoever you'd like to dedicate the merit to, may this happen. And we let the power of Medicine Buddha's mantra go out. Uh, this is a particularly a healing mantra and it's perfect for a time like ours with COVID pandemic. Okay, all right, here we go. Sanjay, 
sádia, Pai é sádia. Sacate sua all for joining everyone look forward to being with you same time next week for more of the flower garden sutra we make three vows bow in respect to the venerable master Hey, that does it for today. See you all next week. Stay well, stay safe. One, two, four.